thanks for uh, having me here today. I met uh, Brady at a design conference a couple of months back, and uh, it was a design conference mostly aimed at sort of academic designers who were very excited about some of the new tools that were coming out in terms of 3D printing and, and Kickstarter and what they saw as ways to innovate design. And I kind of came out and said, oh, that's awesome. It's still hard to actually make things. And Brady came, spoke right after me and said, that's why I'm here is to help people make things. So uh, he invited me to come here today, and I'm, I'm happy to share some of these thoughts. Let me introduce myself. Uh, my name's Robert Evans. I basically do high volume consumer electronics. Years ago, I worked at Microsoft on Microsoft Mice. I was at Flip Video doing the video cameras. I was at Cisco doing the Linksys routers. Uh, high volume consumer products. That before my time. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, we, Cisco ended up acquiring Flip. We became Cisco Consumer Products, and they gave us the Linksys division. And so we did uh, basically all the Linksys routers for the last three years before they shut us down and sold off to Belkin. Long story there. Anyway, I got a uh, broad background. I do product management. I do product development. I ran manufacturing and operations for Flip. Um, so I sort of touched the product process from a lot of different angles. Um, and I think it's been interesting to develop a product and take it up to DVT and then move over onto the manufacturing side and actually figure out how to take this crappy design that some idiot did and actually make a million of them re reliably and repeatedly. And looking at the same problem from different angles is given me what I think is kind of an unusual view on what works and what doesn't. Uh, and so I'm going to tell you more about that. But I also would just want to say congratulations. Um, you know, startups are hard. Most startups fail. Most of my startups have failed. Probably most of yours will fail. And if you're not enjoying what you're doing, if you don't pat yourself on the back for the successes that you've had, if you don't say, this is good, what I've gotten done so far, it's going to be pretty hard to keep on going through the, the bad things that are going to happen. So the fact that you guys are in Highway 1 and, and making new products and have the courage to go do this, I think that's awesome. Seriously. <laughs> Hardware is easier these days than it used to be in terms of coming up with a design and making that first prototype. There are tools, open source hardware, Arduino, MakerBot, et cetera. And these are really interesting tools to allow people who before would have found it too expensive to build that first prototype to now have the ability to do so. It doesn't make, necessarily make it a whole lot easier. If you don't have that degree in electrical engineering, open source hardware is not going to do a whole lot for you. If you don't know how to do 3D CAD, 3D printers won't do a whole lot for you. But it used to be that you'd have that knowledge and you still needed a big company and an expensive machine shop and lots of tools and cost in order to make that prototype. That is now easier and cheaper. And that's why uh, these academics refer to the democratization of innovation, i.e. at this beginning stage, it's so much easier to experiment. It costs less to experiment than it used to. And that's a true fact, and it's, it's an exciting fact, actually. But it still doesn't help you get up over this hump over the adoption hump, over the scaling hump. Fundamentally, the fact that you can now make one does not help you make a million. Scaling is still very, very hard. You know, it's a classic Kickstarter problem. It's awesome. We raised $2 million. They want 10,000 of our units. Now what do we do? Well, you buy your plane ticket, you fly to Shenzhen, and you do it the old-fashioned way. Right? There is no other better solution yet. PCH and the Accelerator and Brady is working on maybe one day that will become the better way. But honestly, it's, it's not there yet. You still have to do these things. So I thought I would talk for a little bit about how Flip got to scale, right? How did we go from nothing? You know, we were 10 people in a, not a garage, but in an office building downtown. And seven or eight years later, we were the number one top selling camcorder in the country, 40% market share, millions of units a year. It was a, it was a great rocket ship ride. How did we do that? I think it was seven, but it was complicated because the first half of the company's existence, we were doing digital still cameras. So there was a com the company was actually called Pure Digital, and we, did, uh, we were trying to compete with the disposable film camera, $10 at Target or whatever. And we thought that if we took a camera, and back then a, a decent digital camera was maybe two megapixels and cost $700. And we said, if, can we make that and sell it for 15 bucks? and compete head-to-head -head with the disposable film cameras. At that point in time, and I haven't given the pure digital pitch in a long time, but the numbers were something like every year in the US, they sold 4 million DSLRs, and they sold 40 million point-and-shoot cameras, and they sold 400 million disposable film cameras. 
and we were going to go do that market. So we took a, dispose, uh, a digital camera, stripped it down, and then moved a lot of the intelligence out of the camera into a server or a, an appliance that we put into drugstores at retail, which is where photo printing happened in the US at the time. And the idea was basically to do sort of a client server model for cameras. The camera would ideally cap do nothing except for capture raw sensor data and all the processing required to make a print of that happen somewhere else. Uh, and it worked. We, we built a good business. We were in 8,000 retail locations. We were making money. Um, but then we came up with the idea of doing flip video, and that was a bigger business. Um, and so from the time we did the first flip video camera to the time that it, we were acquired by Cisco because we had those millions of units and those 40% market share, that was only three years, maybe four. And I'd say you know, most of the growth, you know, the growth curve is like that. All, all the big news happened in the last two years. So let me talk a bit about what it took to get to that. And a big part of the answer was innovation. Right? We had a variety of interesting product innovations. We created a new product category. Right? There was no such thing as a point and shoot video camera before we came along and did that. And we actually we figured that out by looking at our still camera experience, right? that 440, 400. When we looked at the world of video cameras, you had the high-end $1,000 camcorder. There was no such thing as the point-and-shoot camcorder. That space was empty. And we realized that we could go into that space. And we did it at a new price point. Our target price was $100. Some of our products got there. So in a world of $1,000 video cameras, we were selling a $100 video camera. And we created a brand around that, and, and actually quite successfully, we were the number three consumer electronics brand for under 25s in America. And to do that coming out of nowhere is unheard of. We were one of the companies that really capitalized on uh, social media as a way to build brand back when that was a new idea before that became sort of commonplace as it is now and hard to do because everybody else is trying to do it now also. We focused on business innovations. We had an extreme focus on agility. Nothing was more important to us than speed and agility because our competitors were the Canons and Nikons and Sonys of the world, not companies known for speed and agility. We weren't going to beat them at what they were good at. What we could do differently than them is that we could be fast. We customized our products. Right? Back then, cameras were black or maybe silver. We had five different colors, and then we offered custom printing where you could upload an image. We would literally print that onto your camera, and you could have any sort of image you wanted. We took uh, just-in-time production, sort of an old concept about how you build only as you need to bring things to the, uh, to the distributor, and push that upstream. It was part of our, our focus on agility. The metric that we tried to measure ourselves by was how long from idea to store shelf. Right? Traditionally, those things are bucketed. How fast can we do the development? How fast are our operational cycles? How, how fast are our logistics cycles? What's our inventory cycle? We knew that we were turning our product every year. You know, whatever we had built last year, we'd be marking down and selling off because we needed a new product this Christmas. And so it became critical to us to figure out how from you know, we would start a new product in roughly February, and we wanted it on the store shelf at Best Buy in August. How do, how do you do that? You have to move very, very quickly. And, and that was a lot of what we focused our energies on. We had an interesting uh, balance of US and China design philosophy. And, and speaking kind of just sort of you know, in broad stereotypes, US engineering is extremely focused on getting the design right, simulating it, and then locking it down and then taking that bill of materials and controlling it carefully at the factory. Don't change anything in the design, because that'll break my simulation, and then I won't know if it works or not. It's an extremely reliable way of building things. It's kind of heavy up front on the engineering time, and it's kind of expensive at the back end, because it can't cost reduce, but it works. And again, stereotypically, the Chinese approach would be to make a prototype and then to adjust it in tool or on board until it works. Right? You've got a factory right here. I don't need to like create a bomb and send it somewhere else. I'm just going to walk to the factory floor and change that and see what happens. My wife actually used to be a, a product designer for MSR. Not Microsoft Research, but Mountain Safety Research. They do camping gear, carabiners, camp stoves, and such. And her design lab was literally separated by a wall of glass from the factory. And when she had a problem she was debugging or didn't understand why something wasn't working, she was able to walk 30 feet onto the production line and see what was happening to her product. That's an extremely powerful feedback mechanism that with outsourced manufacturing, you lose very quickly. 
So there's this, this dichotomy between how China designs and the US designs, again, just speaking broadly. And it's important, if you can, to figure out how to get both of those together and capture the advantages of both techniques. You know, can you get the reliability of control design? Can you get the speed and flexibility and cost reduction of designing on, on board in tool? Um, and I think you can if you work at that. I'm uh, happy to talk about that in detail if, if people are interested. We also spent a lot of time, and I think the real core of our success was around building an ecosystem. Um, again, our competitors were Sony, Canon, Nikon. We did not have the scale that those companies did, nor would we ever. But we built an amazing ecosystem of people that helped us bring our products to market. On the process side, we had design consultancies like IDEO and Smart Design, manufacturers like Ciccone and Hanhai. PCH did our accessories. Bonta, which is another 3PL, did our logistics. And of course, Amazon and Best Buy were key retail partners for us. And on the technology side, we, we partnered very closely with technology leaders that allowed us to build our products. Uh, Zoran, no longer around today, but they made the imaging, image processor. Samsung, with their flash memory, Aptina sensors, uh, SunX lenses and uh, displays from Sharp. Flip video was maybe 100 people. But when you think about it, we had, I, I don't know, 100,000 people helping us deliver our products. That is how we got to scale without having to build a company the size of Sony. This is how scale really works, right? You need that entire ecosystem to deliver your product. Sony or Apple, they do it on a vertically integrated basis, right? You go to the Apple factory, I make my Apple product, I sell it at the Apple store. None of us have the scale to work that way. We need to be distributed. So you have to have your entire ecosystem aligned to deliver your product. And that entire ecosystem needs to believe in your product, just like they believed in Flip, because you're asking them to invest in your product. Right? Most factories don't need your business. They're busy. Most component <coughs> suppliers don't need your business. They're busy. So why should they give their business to you? Why should they sit down with some company that's going to buy 5,000 of my $1 components and give them the time of day? Well, the only reason is because they believe that if they do that, next year you're going to buy 50,000, and then a year after that, 500,000, and a year after that, 5 million. Right? You have to sell them the vision of your company in the same way you do to your investors and to your consumers, because that's why they will allocate their own limited resources to solving your problems. And they do that because they think they're going to make money doing it. Right? You may be inventing something to bring benefit to the world, to change the world, to make your mark. Samsung doesn't give a shit. They do it to make money. I do it to make money. And if you want my help, their help, the supplier's help, PCH's help, you've got to convince them that they're going to make money by investing in you. In the same way you convince your investors that they're going to make money by investing in you. It's the exact same relationship. And when you do that, you get the advantages of scale. You have the dollars that attracts and motivates the partners. You have the dollars that allows investment in unique processes and technology. Right? Consumer electronics is a scale business because if you don't have scale, then you can only build what everybody else can build. You don't have a unique chipset. You don't have a unique manufacturing process. You don't have something that differentiates you from everybody else because you're going to the same outsourced suppliers as everybody else is going to. By getting to scale or by convincing them that you will get to scale, you can say, I want that unique process first. Develop a new component for me. Tell me what your roadmap is three years down the road so I can design a product that will use that component when it first comes out and let me be your lead to market. Let me show the world that your new technology is great. Now, can this change? It doesn't necessarily need to, right? Small companies get acquired all the time as sort of innovation leaders for big companies. It's a classic big pharma market. So if you don't want to get to scale, you don't necessarily have to to be a successful company that has a small exit. And there may be markets where it doesn't have to, right? This is a, a cool thing I saw the other day. It's a, it's a 3D printed cast, custom fit to your arm and, and to the break in your arm. That's not a scaled business in terms of unit, maybe a scaled production business. But there may be markets, craft brewing, whatever, where you're not the company trying to make a million units, and you've got a good business anyway. And there was a lot of talk, and there's been a lot of talk about new ways to bring ecosystems together where you don't have to know each other, you don't have to have the industry experience, you don't have to have the domain expertise. Maybe those will work. Now, as I said at the beginning of this, I met Brady at a design conference. And at the design conference, I ended the, the presentation here, just saying, when you're trying to scale, mind that gap. 
But I figured that wasn't really useful for people who are actually trying to do this. So let me just keep on going. One thing you've done is join Highway 1. And Brady had a line he used somewhere about um, our goal is to de-risk hardware. I like that line a lot because hardware is considered risky. It's actually considered hard. It's something that I always tell people when they make a mistake in doing hardware for the first time. It's like, yeah, hardware is hard. But that's kind of a naive way to look at it because it's not like software is easy. It's not like all the software startups succeed and hardware is a hard one. The thing about hardware is that it's expensive. Right? If you make a mistake, it is expensive to fix. If you need to build units, it is expensive to build units. You want to distribute units, it's expensive to distribute units. And so mistakes are expensive. You've got to fix that inventory, call it back from the store, pay somebody to take apart the box and put in the cable you left out, whatever. It is not that it is harder than software. It's that it's more expensive than software. And as a business that has a limited amount of cash, mistakes become riskier. They are more damaging than they are in the software business. And the idea of de-risking hardware, I think, is the right way to think about it. How do we minimize the financial risk of what we're doing so that we can achieve our goals? Now, sitting on high, my advice would be don't do a hardware company. Don't be a hardware company. <laughs> because it's risky, and you're trying to avoid risk. Now, I'm saying that in part to be provocative uh, because there's huge opportunities in hardware. And some of us, myself included, just think that products are cool and I want to make things. I mean, the thing that motivates me is the idea of something I've built I can see in your hand. And when I walk around an office building and see a mouse, or I walk down the street and see a video camera, or I go into somebody's home and see a router that I built, that's just what, that's why I do this. But look back at what we did with Flip. Do you flip, join the movement, watch some videos? We were not a video camera company. We did not invent any technology. We did not build a chipset. We did not do R&D, right? We were a branding product sales company that came up with a vision that we sold to consumers. Did we have to build hardware to do that? Yes, we did. But I want you to think of your hardware as a necessary evil. What is the benefit you are bringing to your consumers? And the fact that you have to build something to do that means it's more expensive than it ought to be. The fact that you have to ship something to make that happen, that's unfortunate but necessary. But think about what the benefit is that you're bringing your consumers, because that's the only thing that you've got going for you. Hardware, anybody else can do it. But the benefit to the consumer is a unique proposition, because theoretically, at least, the thing you're building is the only way to deliver that benefit. At Flip, I was telling the story earlier about how we'd been around pure, as pure digital for several years before we became Flip. That gave us deep industry knowledge. Right, we'd been to the camera retailers for four years, banging on their doors, saying, sell our product. We were involved in the technology. Right, we saw, I mean, the reason that we did a video camera is that for the first time ever, the DSPs that we used to build still cameras were capable of video compression. You could not do it a year before. Right, the first time you could have a chip at a reasonable cost point that did SD quality video compression on battery power was the year that we did the first flip video camera. And the first year that flash memory got cheap enough <coughs> that you could build a video camera based on flash rather than on tape was the year that we did the flip video camera. We couldn't have done it a year before. And had we waited two years, somebody else probably would have done it. But we were there in place with those technologies, and so we had that knowledge. And we had a deep understanding of the consumer, because we spent four years talking to consumers about why they take pictures and why they share pictures and what makes them want to pay money for a product, a benefit, a service. And we realized, you know, we encapsulated it as shoot anything, share everything. Right? Video cameras used to be these expensive things that dad brought out on the weekend to videotape the birthday party, and then took the tape and put it in the closet. You never saw it again. That's what video was. But we were there, you know, at the same time as flash memory and DSP, things like YouTube came along. For the first time ever, shoot anything and share it with everybody really easily. That benefit was never possible before, and that's what we as a company helped to deliver. We enabled that with our hardware. And so we built this entire ecosystem of investors and component suppliers and manufacturers and retailers, all to deliver that benefit, right? Nobody really needed another video camera. And all the other video camera companies that came along tried to sell their video cameras based upon megapixels and, and uh, resolution and battery life, and we didn't do any of that, right? We were gonna help you share your memories and use our services, use our products, use the things that we've built to help you do that. 
that I, I truly believe is what made us successful. It's what differentiated us from all the hardware companies that were making hardware for the purpose of selling hardware. Nobody wants hardware. I don't need things. Right? I buy things for a reason. What is the reason that someone's going to buy what you're building? How do you deliver that? Focus on your vision. It's hard, very hard, by the way, to find a vision slide on the internet. It's not just really cheesy. It's the best I could do. Your vision is what enables you to reach scale. Right? It's not because you're sitting in a garage designing a hardware product. That's not why you're going to be successful. Your vision is what allows you to align yourselves internally. It allows you to get investment by aligning your investors with you. It's what allows you to find your customers who wants what you're offering. It allows you to find your, as you grow, to align your development team to let's all build the same thing as opposed to wander off in our different directions. It allows your suppliers. All of this is how you get to be from zero to a billion. And most people, there's this like, this like vision of, uh, not vision, there's, a, there's an image of what your vision is. I'm going to be a billion dollar company. My charts are up and to the right. Consumers love my stuff. You do it to raise money, and then you hire a marketing team to brand it. That's true. That is all true. And if you guys are going to be successful at scale, you're going to do that. But it is not enough. Right? Vision and the communication of that vision is what allows you to find partnerships in your supply chain, in your, op in your retail chain, in all the different operational aspects of a company that you want to build to be successful. Because that's how you get to that scale thing again, right? Foxconn is better at supply chain than you will ever be. Samsung is better at manufacturing than you will ever be. Apple is better at engineering than you will ever be. If you're trying to say, I'm going to build a better product than Apple, that is a wrong strategy, right? Because they have 10,000 people. They've been working for 30 years with a billion dollars. And you can't compete against that, right? So be smart about it. Jiu-jitsu about it, right? What are you good at? And what do you have that's different from them? At Flip, we realized that we had agility. Like the one thing we had going for us, we had an idea, but everyone started copying that six months later. But could we innovate faster? Could we deliver faster? Could we just do things differently than the industry had before? And it was those differences that allowed us to be successful. We didn't do big television ads. I just got one more slide, and I'll answer that question. We didn't do big television advertising because we went through social media. We were the first to really capitalize on having our own website where we could sell things at full price and capture that margin rather than sell only through distribution and retail. Right? Can you figure out what is different about the service, the benefit, the offering you're bringing to consumers that allows you to offer that in a way that does not compete head to head with these people already at scale? And can you assemble that team that allows you to compete as close to scale as you can because you still it's going to be hard and you need that scale anyway? And how you balance those two things is what's going to either make you successful or not. Right? Because fundamentally, you guys need to be visionaries. You're not supposed to be here to be hardware engineers building a gadget. Right? You're here to build companies. And your company will be successful because you see something that I don't, and that Apple doesn't, and Samsung doesn't. And you see an opportunity that, for whatever reason, nobody else is going after yet. Figure out how to deliver on that and just bring the hardware along with you as you need to. That's what I got today. You had a question? Yeah, so do you define agility as being able to do more different things? Do you define, how do you define agility? Because yep. you were saying, is it just the ability to do more different things than other competitors are doing faster? Yeah, I think you know, there's lots of ways to define it, and many of them, you know, none of them are wrong. What, what I saw as important, what I was specifically referring to there is, once you're in the hardware business, you have this difficult process of getting stuff from the engineering design is complete to the consumer has bought it. There's a lot of steps along the way, and they all get screwed up all the time. Right? You have to manufacture the product. You have to deliver the product to warehouse. You have to inventory the product. You have to get it onto the shelf. You have to sell it on the shelf. Some percentage come back. You have to manage those as well. Traditional supply chains are very, very slow through that process. It will take four to six months from the time you manufacture a product to the time somebody buys it. And that's four to six months where you've paid for it, and no one's paid you for it. All right, because you bought it from the factory, and now you're waiting for someone to buy it from Best Buy and Best Buy to send you a check. So figuring out how to shorten that cycle, like one easy answer these days is Amazon. Right? Amazon is faster than that. But that's still a three-month cycle, right? which is not bad. 
figuring out how to deliver units and get paid faster, change your units so you don't have a huge inventory of last year's product that you've got to sell at half price because you've got to clear the inventory somehow. Right? Watching inventory flow, that's what I was really focusing on when I said that. I think you can take it on the development side as well. I mean, it's equally true. Um, how do you change the product to be what people want faster than the competitors do? How do you take advantage of new technologies faster than your competitors do? Um, I actually think it's, there are more people trying to compete on development agility and less people trying to compete on operational agility. And that, that's a missed opportunity. You need, you should, ideally, you do both. So uh, my question is, <clears throat> how important is it to come up with a new model every single year? Because, I mean, we see that, like, in the ski industry, you know, there's, they're not really innovating. They're just coming up with a new, like, color. I mean, how, how important is that to the customer that they have to, like, you know, see a new product every year? I think it's important. I think, uh, you know, fundamentally it's not a question of product technology. It's not a question of what the benefit is that you're delivering. It's a question of what sells really well. Right, and it's, it's nice that we have some invention that we think is great, but if it doesn't sell, we've out of business anyway. And people have found out repeatedly that new models coming out drive increased sales. To my knowledge, and you know, let's, I'm sure you guys are gonna bring in a, a marketing MBA from Stanford who can talk about this better than I can, but from my knowledge, there's two reasons this is true. One is because the easiest person to sell your product to is the person who already has it. I bought your product two years ago and I like it and it broke or I want a new one or you've got a new one that's better. You have an existing connection to that customer. They're interested in your space. They believe in you as a supplier. They're, they took a risk on a young company. So it's easier to sell to them, but you need something to sell to them and a new model does that. You know, different colors, right? It does not need to be a, a fundamental change in the market, but it does help you sell back to the customer you already have. And then the other on a more you know, engineering driven side is if you're doing a technology product, actually technology does tend to advance. And you will see that you have two choices. One is you can take the product that you have and not change it and it will be cheaper next year than this year, right? Memory prices go down another X percent. The processor is last year's model and so you can get it cheaper. And you could, you will have a competitor that comes at you with this year's product. You have the choice to sell last year's product at a lower price. You've just taken down your revenue and your margin. Or you can bring out a new competitive product, which is probably about the same cost as it was last year, because this year's memory, you know, processor costs about as much as last year's processor, and stay at that price point and defend your, your business structure, your, your revenue targets, your, your margin targets. And so for both of those reasons, companies tend to bring out new products every year. I think in general, it's a good idea. There's exceptions to every rule, but I'd be leery of them. So with customization, when is it appropriate to start making the same product with multiple colors? Or, you know, obviously if we're just starting out, we want to probably focus on just one. How do you know when it's appropriate to start customizing? So uh, true story, at Flip we did five colors at any given time. We rotated the colors seasonally. We do a black, a white, and then blue, yellow, green, or whatever. We did, plus we did custom printing. Uh, where literally we would, we had a fancy printer that would print an image onto a camera and then we would mail it to you. So upload a picture, we'll mail you a camera. We spent a lot of time and money forecasting different colors of cameras. We spent a lot of time and money developing different colors of cameras, developing this customization process. 70% of the cameras we sold were black. 20% of the cameras we sold were white. One or 2% of everything else. And despite knowing that for multiple years, we continued to do it. Because when you have multiple colors, you take up more room on the shelf. You've got more units, you get more footage, right? And that is your billboard at Best Buy or at wherever you're selling. You have a customization story, people come to your website and play with the personalization. People write about it. And that, then they decide to buy black anyway. But you got the sale. So, you know, on my, with my operational hat on, I'll say never ever do it because no one ever buys those things anyway and it just makes my, my operational life harder. But with a business hat on, think of about it not as a, um, think of it as a marketing expense, as a publicity expense. 
And I think that when you put that hat on, you'll find that actually you sell more units overall and they justify their cost, even if the units you sell remain the, the black or the white or the standard unit. Would you suggest starting with customization, like starting your uh, product, or, or save that till you've dialed in your product and, and kind of It, it really depends on the product. You know, the, uh, one of the problems you find with customization is that you, what about returns? Right, you've just built a customized product. Um, and when we did customized product, we actually ended up just scrapping them. And we took a $150 camera and did, threw it away because the cost of turning it back into a, a generic camera was low. Uh, I'm sorry, it was high. And it just wasn't, it didn't pencil out, um, didn't pencil out to make sense. So we, uh, I think customization is something that you should be very careful of looking at the entire life cycle of that customized product. If, if you've got a business where there's some snap-on plastic lid and you can throw away the plastic lid, well, okay, maybe that's a different story. If you've got a business where customization is your story, you only sell customized, that's a different story. But I would encourage you to look at the entire life cycle of the product and make sure it makes sense all the way through. Um, thanks for coming in and talking to us. This is fantastic. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the decision process that went from the pure digital to the flip and how you decided, you know, what you were doing was the right thing? I, I imagine at the time there was not, you know, you didn't know it was going to be successful. It was not and, obvious, no. And, yeah. Sure. Um, so we started pure digital 2001, I think it was. And after four years, we had gone to a place where, as I said, we were in, uh, 8,000 retail locations, which is essentially every drugstore in America. Right? We, we got the deals with CVS and Duane Reed and Walgreens and the rest of the big chains. And I told you that we had gone to this sort of client-server model to get a camera to be really cheap. But we weren't able to get it cheap enough. And we, every time we brought down our cost, the uh, film camera guys brought their cost down lower. So when we started, a high-end disposable film camera was 15, 16 bucks. And when we left, they were three for 10. Right, so, because they, all their costs were sunk, right? They've been making this crap for years, right? So there was no, they didn't, they didn't have the challenges that we did in bringing costs down. And so we moved to a business model that wasn't actually truly disposable, it was recycling. So we got the cost of a camera down to sub 30 bucks, but we needed to sell it to Costco or to Best, or not Best Buy, uh, CVS for 10 bucks, which they would then retail at 15. That was round numbers, our pricing. And so what we realized is that we would, what we did was embark on a business model where I would sell, I would make a camera for 30 bucks. And I would sell it to CVS for 10 bucks. I lost 20 bucks that quarter on that unit. They would sell it to you for 15 bucks. You would take your 24 pictures or your 36 pictures and you'd bring it back and you'd give them the camera back. They'd give you your pictures and mail me the camera. And I would refurbish that camera, clean the memory, put on a new box, and then I'd sell it back to Costco or CVS for another 10 bucks. So that second quarter, it cost me $1, let's say, to refurb the camera, and I sold it for 10. I just made nine bucks. And then I would do that again the next quarter. And so it took about nine months, and we broke even on the camera. And then past that, it was pretty much pure profit. So it was an interesting business model in that we spent a lot of time trying to predict, if I sell you a camera today, when do I get it back, right? Is it Thanksgiving, and you take a picture that weekend, and you process it right away? Awesome, because I cycle that camera faster. Did you buy it and, you know, it's going to take you, you took 20 pictures that day, but there are four more pictures and you're going to wait six months to take those four pictures before you pay for processing. Did you buy it and you, you put it in the car dashboard in case it was ever a wreck and we never ever see that camera again. I'm telling this story the long way, but essentially we found ourselves in a business that was hard to predict how fast we would make money at. And that for us to expand, the first thing that we did when we landed a new customer was take a huge loss that quarter as I sold cameras for 10 bucks that cost me 30 to build. We had grown to a point where we had filled the US market. Our next step was international expansion and it was gonna be extremely expensive and we'd have to take on a lot of new debt or equity in order to fund that investment, which frankly was gonna dilute us more than we personally wanted to be diluted. Right? I mean, at the end of the day, we were working at this company and we we're hoping to make some money off of it. It had just so happened, as I said, that we had seen this technology advancing uh, and we'd actually done a disposable video camera. You got 15 minutes of video for 20 bucks or something. It didn't sell a whole lot, but it got a lot of press. And we saw that, yeah, you can actually do this now for the first time ever. So we ended up setting up a, a group. Actually, I, I 
at that time I was doing development and my last project was doing the development of the first flip video camera. And we, uh, we built a prototype and we showed it to Target and Target said, that's awesome, we'll take 10,000. And we said, oh shit, I mean, it was just a prototype. Um, and that story I was telling earlier is true. I spent the next four months on a crash project to make the first 10,000 and that's when I decided to move into manufacturing and took that crash project to make 10,000 of them and they sold. We said, okay, there's a business here. People want these and we'll buy them. So we had a great proof point. But it was still very hard because we had a company that was structured one way. We had a boatload of software engineers that did image processing stations, right? Our hardware business was really small. We did not have a brand, right? We sold our, our cameras as CVS or as Dwayne Reed cameras, not as uh, uh, flip or pure digital cameras. So the way we ended up deciding to do it was to, say, to take our original business and say, we're going to run this as a cash cow. Right? It makes good money as long as we don't try to expand, right? Because those cameras keep coming back and we keep selling them again. So let that run and take that money to build the flip video camera business. And we actually separated the companies into two. Right? We had separate business units, which you know, for a small company is unusual. And one co company was dedicated to creating a brand, getting its investment, uh, building those units and running that off that way. And we ran the two businesses in parallel for two years, I think. Something like that. So it was actually easier, in some ways, easier than it looked like to start a new business because we didn't shoot the old one in the head and bet everything on the new one. It was harder than it might sound because we were, you know, what does the CEO worry about every morning? You know, do you take your head of marketing and ask him to sell the product you have or to think about branding for something new? How do you allocate your own mental mind share when you're trying to ride two horses at once? It, you know, it worked out for us, but uh, I don't think that's a, a normal process to go through. Uh, so another quick question I have. Uh, you said that you were doing direct sales from your site, uh, and then you're also doing retail. So how do you reconcile the two? Because you can't be selling the same thing that the retail is selling, or, or, or else you're kind of like competing against them, and then they would get kind of pissed off. So did you guys just do like the customization uh, through your site? No, we ended up, uh, we did sell the same thing to both uh, through retail and via our online store. So at our online store, you could buy any of our cameras, the same cameras you'd get at Amazon or at Best Buy. You could buy all of our accessories. We did tripods and waterproof cases and all the like. You know, all of which you could get from Amazon, most of which you couldn't get at retail, right? They just didn't carry as wide a selection. And we sold our personalized stuff. And the vast majority of our business uh, remained the cameras, so just the standard cameras. It was interestingly enough, we tended to sell not a camera, but a camera plus an accessory. Uh, we think it was a gift thing. Uh, and what we did to make that okay with retail is that we only sold at full price. So if you bought a camera from Flip Video directly and it was a 129 camera, you paid 129. There was never a discount. So at Amazon, you always paid, you know, Amazon was always the lowest price, maybe 119, 109, 99. Best Buy was frequently low price, but they also, we showed them and we had the, the we had the metrics to show it that people would come to our website and look at our website and that actually drove people to retail. Like, yeah, I want one of those, but I want to go touch it first. And so Best Buy believed that because we weren't competing with them on price and because we were sending them customers, that they were okay with that. Now, I've actually never understood why somebody went to flip the flip.com and paid us $129 for a camera that they could get for $99 from Amazon and not pay for shipping. So I mean, we, we charge for shipping as well. I guess I do it sometimes because I know that if I buy it directly from you, as a small company, you get more money than if I buy it from Amazon. But most people don't think that way. They don't have that knowledge. And why they continue to buy from us rather than from the cheaper, more easier sources was a, a thing we long debated. And the best answer we came up with was brand loyalty, that we had actually created a strong enough brand that people thought they were entering, and, and they were entering into a trusted relationship with us. They wanted to buy from us. And we did take care of our customers very well. Um, and we did see customer service as one of our main ways of gathering information and, uh, and gathering sort of what, what's the, what are the, not only are the problems with our existing products, but what do customers want? What do they want more of? How can we make them happier? Customer service for us was a way to get that information rather than being an expense. And so we were happy to have that direct relationship with the customers, even though it, it drove our expenses up because we got that information. 
So what would you say the percentage of, uh, you know, direct sales versus retail? Was it like, you know, 5% direct sales? And the, the no, we did pretty good. We did about 20% direct sales, which is unusually high. Um, and different companies have different strategies about this. You know, some don't do direct sales. It's a pain in the ass to do direct sales. You've got to set up someone to do it for you. You've got to take care of your own inventory, your own forecasting. You know, and better, better just have a website and then send everybody to Amazon or Best Buy, right? Makes life easier. Um, some people have different philosophies about, you know, let's say your product's in demand for Christmas. Um, do you stock your website or do you stock Best Buy? Right, which is better for your company? If you don't stock Best Buy, you're going to piss them off. They're going to kick you off the shelf. Best Buy is great advertising, right? People walk through the store and they see your product on the shelf. Best Buy sends out circulars. It's, it's an advertising thing just to be in a store that you don't necessarily get from your own website. But you get more margin, more dollars, if you sell it via your website. And your website's kind of a marketing tool as well. So this is not like there's a right way to do it. At Flip, we decided that our website was our primary channel and that in our dream world, we would never work with Amazon or Best Buy. In reality, they were, you know, they were the majority of our sales went through those two companies. But ideally, we'd have a direct uh, connection to our customer. We would sell it directly and take care of them. Other, other companies think differently about that, and I'm not saying that there's a better answer. If you were launching uh, today, would you consider going directly online? Do you think it would, would, even if you didn't, do you think that the 20% would be a greater burden than those? I would definitely think about it. I don't think the 20% would necessarily be higher. I mean, if you're in Amazon, if you're in Best Buy, you're going to sell a lot of units that way. Um, you know, Best Buy is a, it's great to be in Best Buy, and the only problem is that you're in Best Buy, right? You've got all these inventories and returns, and they want money from you, and they're going to go out of business maybe this year or next year or the year after, or not, who knows, right? It's a constant debate. Circuit City's gone. All sorts of retailers are gone. There's basically nobody left except for Best Buy which puts them in a pretty strong position to negotiate with you, which is a pain in the ass. Amazon is nice, right, because they've got that short inventory cycle, and they'll take all your stuff because they don't have any warehouse expenses to speak of. But just because you're available on Amazon doesn't mean anybody can find you on Amazon. There's so much stuff there that you're lost in the noise. I don't think, if I, if I were starting a business tomorrow, I would definitely have my own distribution channel my thinking, because I get the margin, I get the contact with the customer, and I build my brand. And the real question is, would I also do these other things or not? At the end of the day, I think that I would, because they get you to volume faster. It's hard to deliver all your volume on your own site, not because of the infrastructure or the operational issues. It's because of the marketing reach and the advertising reach that being in Best Buy and Amazon can get you if you're successful. But they come at cost, right? They're not free. There's a lot of support, a lot of hand-holding, a lot of money to be spent uh, treating those partners right and getting treat treated right by them. There's a lot of knowledge, right? You have to become an expert on how Amazon works, right, and how their, their forecasting tools work. And, and this, like, how do you sell to Amazon? It's not as easy as just calling up the phone and saying, take my product. Do you want to spend your time that way? Is it feasible? I'm, I've, I've actually, I was looking at starting a company recently, and I was thinking, like, well, maybe it's online only for the first 6 to 12 months. And I, I think that's kind of appealing because in the first 6 to 12 months, it's almost nice to hold your volume down because you probably didn't do something right, and I'd rather take 1,000 returns than 100,000 returns. Right? And, and does that allow you to sort of manage your own scaling a little bit better? Maybe. I'm not going to give you a straight answer because I think it, it very much depends, but it's there's not a wrong answer either. I would definitely think about those, all the options. You got a question? Yeah, I remember uh, when you actually had a lot of media exposure, like there were bands in the press that played Oprah, mm -hmm. something about it. Um, so it seems like you guys sent either, they, you sent the units to the celebrities to, so was that kind of like shotgun approach or was there a lot of planning involved in just like who to, who to, who to because it's a cost to you as well. Yeah, okay. that started just by luck. Uh, that was not a, a strategy that we went out with. Um, but we had something that actually was cool. We did hit a nerve, and celebrities did start using us. Our, we started showing up in pictures of celebrities would be a better way to say it. Um, our focus, when we were doing uh, the disposable still camera, our focus was on mom. And even at the beginning of Flip Video, our focus was on mom. Majority of pictures taken in the US are by mothers of young children. 
majority of photo and video sharing in the US, and this is true worldwide, we were just primarily US focused at the time, done by young mothers. And so we were trying to figure out the, uh, you know, how do we sell to them? And one of the easy ways to sell to them was Oprah, it was talk shows. We worked hard intentionally to get on talk shows. We did not see the huge spikes in sales that we heard you'd get by being on one of Oprah's favorite things or whatever, but we did see big spikes in awareness and marketing. And when we grew our video camera business, we decided sort of, okay, Oprah's not really doing it for us, but hey, young rock bands are using us to chronicle their road trips. We have an opportunity here, let's go after that. It was a very conscious thing. We did not shotgun it because uh, what we believed was that if we gave it away for free to lots of people, it would be treated like trash. We found ways to establish direct connections to celebrities and have somebody walk up and put it in their hand. We ended up hiring a woman, uh, Jody Leip, out of LA, who has a lot of, her business is doing that. Right? She develops those connections and, and helps you place your products. Um, I think it was extremely successful for us doing what we did. I, I don't know if it'd be successful for a washing machine or for all products, but it was successful for us. And one thing to think about, uh, you know, an interesting tidbit there is, we designed our camera in part to be recognizable when you took a picture of it. That when somebody was standing there, taking a video, and you took a picture of me, you knew that was a flip camera, right? So that became advertising for us. Our cameras looked like all the other cameras. I don't know if had a flip or a Canon or a Kodak, I don't know. But we, despite some of the draw technical drawbacks and limitations of a, of a vertical orientation, we kept that on purpose for just that reason. I hope that helps. So you said you had a little trial by fire when you first went to China for manufacturing. What were some of the issues you encountered and would tell us to avoid? Um, so many scars. Um, I think we were um, somewhat naive about what it was like to be a small company working with a large company. Right? We, the people who funded or founded Flip all had sort of big company experience before. We had some startup guys that were but all of our startup experience was on the software side. We had never been a small company trying to convince you know, a, a multi-billion dollar manufacturer to make our product for us. And it was extremely hard. Because of the nature of our product, our manufacturers were in Taiwan. Right? There are historical distributions of manufacturing expertise. Um, the camera business was fundamentally China, uh, Japanese. Most of the manufacturers manufactured in Japan. Then they started moving their low-end product out of Japan into China with their own captive factories. And then the Taiwanese got into that business using the first generation of uh, off-the-shelf chips. You know, companies like Zoran who would actually provide a, uh, a chip you could build a camera around as opposed to Sony or Canon who had their own chips they developed in-house. So it just so happened that all the camera manufacturers were Taiwanese guys manufacturing in China. So we went to Taiwan a lot and lot, knocked on a lot of doors. Um, and this, this issue of selling the vision is essentially how we convinced companies to try to take on our product. In our first five years, uh, we probably switched manufacturers four times. And that was extremely painful, extremely dumb, and to be avoided if at all possible. And I would note I was not running manufacturing when we did that. But we were chasing what always seemed like the better deal a lower price, or we had burnt a relationship because, yeah, we promised you 50,000 units, I know, but we only need another five because our sales didn't line up like we thought. And then they would draw back on their investment in us and we'd find another partner and sell them on the vision again. I think when we became successful, it was a combination of two things. One is we decided to lock down partners. So from the time that we started Flip Video to the end, we had two manufacturing partners in parallel. We never changed them. Um, and we did that because of our focus on agility. And the, the connection there is that we outsourced, as I expect most of you will, a lot of our engineering to our manufacturing partners. If we had to sp effectively spin up a new engineering team each time we move manufacturers, there's a huge loss of knowledge, of communication, of trust there as you get to know a new team. By working with the same team repeatedly, we got all their home telephone numbers, right? We knew them well. We knew how to communicate with them. We knew that they were really good at this and pretty good at that, and no, don't let them do that part. We, we built a team. And so we actually, I think more than many companies, integrated our, our ODM engineering teams and our local manufacturing teams. 
And most of our hardware engineering for, for the majority of the company's life was, in fact, outsourced. So I would encourage, you asked me about the, the trials by fire. You know, don't go chasing these uh, short-term wins. The, the value of a long-term relationship is not to be underestimated. It's not to be underestimated in terms of speed of development. It's not to be underestimated in terms of what happens when something goes wrong, right? There's a problem in the product. I have to recall 10,000 units. Was it manufactured wrong? Was it a design flaw? Was it a component flaw? I don't know, but if I don't get these units fixed and back on the shelf in four weeks, I'm out of business. Will your manufacturer take them back and fix them for you and worry, at, worry later about who's going to take the cost? Not in those short-term relationships, right? First, they will negotiate with you a cost and a blame, and then they will agree who pays for shipping, and then they'll t maybe take them back. But if they are expecting to work with you for the next five or ten years, and they're invested in your growth, they'll jump in feet first. If, if you have the sort of relationship you need in order to be successful. Hi. Uh, I was just curious, how did you, um, like nowadays, everybody, pretty much everybody goes through Indiegogo or uh, Kickstarter. Uh, so I'm guessing like in the, when you guys started, there was no such thing. So I wanted to understand better how do you guys uh, do your launch. And it's probably be going to become a lost art as more and more people go into the crowdfunding. But I think that knowing a little bit about the skills and, and the process that you follow might be still useful. Um, to get funded or to actually do the launch itself? No, to do the, uh, the launch, how do you get awareness uh, with people? How do you uh, do your, your launch? And, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, it really depended at which stage of the company it was at. I, I think they, at Flip Video, I'm going to focus on that because it was more of a consumer brand as opposed to the white label stuff we did for the still cameras. Our first launch was extremely small. We relied primarily on our retail partner and their circulars and their advertising to drive awareness. Um, and then we did a bunch of uh, PR campaigns. And we, we got a little bit of tech press. But frankly, tech press doesn't sell a whole lot of product to anyone except for early adopters. And we weren't an early adopter product. We were still focused on mom. So that's what drove us towards this celebrity endorsement stuff. It's relatively cheap. It, it gets you press. It works. Um, not easy to do, and it, you have to have a product that a celebrity wants to be seen with in public. So if it's something for the home, hard to be seen with in public. If it's not cool, hard to get them to, to do it. And harder now, perhaps, than it was then, just because more people are doing, have this idea already. But you know, cheap publicity is, is always good. Right? That's never going to change. It's only when you get more money that you can afford expensive publicity. I'm not sure it, we did any better with that. We did television campaigns our last uh, year or two. Yeah, they drove sales, but they were hugely expensive, right? It, you know, were they necessary to get the brand to the next level? The guys that spent the money told us that they had spent it well. well you know, it's really hard to tell for sure. You know, I, I think it's a, it's a matter of figuring out who your customers actually are. Who's going to buy your product now? Not, not the glorious future where everybody wants one, but who's actually going to take a risk on this product from an unknown company? And how do you reach out to them? How do you get in front of them? And that's probably a really small niche of people. It's not like young moms, which is our target. It's young moms, baby, don't have a camera already. You know, we, we could slice and dice it a bunch of ways. Holiday schedules, dads and grads, Christmas breaks, Christmas presents, right? We just, we would slice and dice until we got it down to something where literally we knew how to hit just those people. And then we'd figure out how to do it really cheaply. Anything else? One more? Okay. So you mentioned some of your product development schedules were about six months or so. Uh, how do you get such fast lead times with taking into account development, like engineering development, and also the long lead times for manufacturers? Uh, did you offload any of that work to have the manufacturers help you out with some of that? Or you know, if you have somebody developing a new screen or that kind of thing or new components, yeah. uh, how did you manage that? Yeah. I mean, obviously, you can't develop a new chip and ship your product in six months. You can't do a new LCD screen and ship your product in six months. Um, we would spend a lot of time working with our technology providers, the chips, the screens, et cetera, ahead of the product kickoff. Right? Sharp was our primary partner for screens. So we would spend a lot of time with them on the supply side, figuring out what they had coming down the road. 
so that when we were ready to start a project, we knew that at about the time that we would want to ship, these three options would be available from Sharp. And then we certainly moved fast by offloading a lot of engineering work to the, develop, to the manufacturer or to design consultancies and to do some internally as well. But we also took a, a uh, what we called a lead time driven uh, development technology. So for example, uh, on an existing LCD screen that's in production at that point in time, the lead time was six months from the time you cut the PO to you got the unit. So we would buy the LCD screens when we launched the product. The project, excuse me, when we launched the project. Before we had locked down the design, we went out and bought the components. What is the lead exactly. Yeah. Right. This is the screen. The longest lead, lead, longest lead item was the screen. So lock down the screen and make the camera work with the screen. If something doesn't work, you change everything else until the screen works. Because we bought it, and now we're going to have to ship it. And, you know, and one of the scary things about our business, and depending on your business, this may be true as well, is we had Christmas. We did 50% of our revenue in Q4 every year. So every year, and every year our growth was like this. So every year our Q4 was bigger than any Q4 we'd ever done before. Which meant in Q2, we'd guess how big Q4 was going to be and spend all the money we had ordering components for Q4 without knowing for sure how many we were going to sell. We effectively had to bet the company every year in April, which was scary as shit. Did you have right. to pay for those components up front? Uh, at the beginning, yes, we negotiated deals as we went to sort, you know, get some uh, lines of credit to get, to get better deals. But even without that, we took on the liability, right? Yes, we may not have had the cash flow hit in April, but we signed a purchase order for 100,000 LCD screens or whatever your number might be. Um, and that is extremely risky. This is a, a, a fundamental problem in the hardware business. If you're growing, then every year you're going to sell more units than you sold last year which means you don't have enough money to pay for those units. It's just a fact of life. It is one of the reasons that we sold out. It was one of the reasons we sold to Cisco. We had just come through the, the financial crash. We had no money. We were going to bet the company yet again. And the thing that scared us so much was that the economy was in the crapper. So were consumers going to buy video cameras this Christmas or not? And it wasn't even Christmas, right? This was. May, June, the economy had just collapsed. Would it come back by Christmas or not? Uh, the Lehman crash, whichever year that was. Oh, wait. Um, and that's what drove us to sell to a large extent, was this realization that we, we had won the bet every year. That wasn't going to last forever. Well, I'm going to be around for another hour or so. If people have other questions, just. Come over and talk to me. It's been great chatting with you. Thank you.